and have us, your children, to be edified, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. It is a great pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you, Pastor Anderson, for inviting me and allowing me to preach at this conference. Faith Forward Baptist Church has been a great inspiration to many when it comes to missions, and a lot of souls have been saved as a result of the efforts of this church. And Lord willing, it's the same in the future. That's why we go to missions conferences like this, and thank you all for coming on a Saturday morning to hear about missions. It definitely is encouraging to see people care about lost souls. And today we're going to be talking about Germany. In March, I got a chance to go to Germany, to a city called Pforzheim, and visit a soul winning group that is there, preach a couple sermons for them, go soul winning throughout that week. And I had a great time. Basically, it was just a random day in March, and I get a phone call from Brother Segura just saying, hey, you want to go to Germany? I'm like, sure, let's do it. And I just got out the Pimsler app, and I just started doing two lessons a day and Duolingo all day, and my wife was so annoyed hearing German all the time. But I was just trying to cram as much German as I can into that, and uh, I got to a pretty okay level to survive there. But the title of my sermon this morning is Germany, Light Shining in Darkness. Light Shining in Darkness. Now, I want to break up this message into two parts. First, I just want to explain how the trip went from just a pure enjoyment perspective. And just from a pure carnal perspective, how the trip went. And then we'll talk about some spiritual lessons. So just some observations from going to Germany, and this was the first time I've been to Europe or to Germany, was that the place was absolutely beautiful. Uh, Pforzheim is located on the southwestern portion of Germany, right on the edge of the Black Forest, which is known as just a very beautiful place. It kind of reminded me of Washington State a little bit, the weather and beauty there. But what was funny is I was told, oh, sorry, you had to experience the ugly part of Germany. And I was like, okay, well, if four times the ugly part, you know, I'd love to see what the beautiful part is like, because I thought it was wonderful. It was a great time. Um, the city, four times, is known as being a jewelry and watchmaking city. So its nickname is Goldstadt, the city of gold. Uh, it's known for making those things. The weather there, if you are like me and you don't like sunburns, the weather was wonderful. If you love the weather here in Phoenix, probably not going to like the weather that much, but good weather. The hospitality of the Germans there was amazing, and it was really encouraging to meet these soul winners and Christians, how we're separated by the Atlantic Ocean, we're separated by multiple time zones, but when I went to Germany, I just instantly had great camaraderie and fellowship with the Christians there, and they really inspired me. They're really just excellent, awesome people. You know, I get off the plane and this guy, Brother Kai, who's the most stereotypical looking German you could possibly imagine, he shows up and he's like, here's some German pretzels and some German water from the Black Forest. And he's just driving me around everywhere. And just, he's a great guy. And that whole, that whole group there was really uh, wonderfully hospitable. They put up with my thousands of questions. Wie sagt man auf Deutsch? How do you say this in German? Just asking them a million times, you know, how do you say this in German? How do you say this in German? They put up with it. They were great fellowship. Uh, really encouraging. Um, the language, when it comes to Fort Syme, at least this is my experience, there was not really a lot of English speakers there. Um, and the English that I did encounter was very, very rudimentary to the, fact, to the point where even the hotel staff, one of the hotel staff members, I was trying to communicate like, hey, the lights aren't working in my, my room because I didn't know you had to plug a card into the wall in Germany to get the lights to work. She couldn't communicate with me. So I'm glad I hit those Pimsler apps really hard because it kind of helped me survive and asking like, wie viel Uhr ist da, uh, die Frühstücke? When's the back breakfast? And like stuff like that. I was able to kind of survive with a little bit of Pimsler. But I would say if you go to four-time Germany, you should spend some time learning German. Um, I was able to get one person saved on this trip because it was pretty much the only person that I could find that could speak good enough English to where I could preach them the gospel. Now, the Germans, of course, were getting lots and lots of people saved, and that's because they speak German. So really, I was mostly a silent partner on this trip, which, but it was still really fun, and it was really a good time. The food there, I will say, of all the missions trips that I've been on, I've been to Mexico and the Bahamas, uh, I will say Germany had the best food by far of any of the missions trips. Germans know how to cook steak, and boy, that is important to me. And that, that was wonderful. The breakfast there, the coffee, I mean, everything about the food there was great. When it comes to the people, um, one big issue that Germany has right now is there's so many Muslims there. And when I 
landed in the airport. I landed in Stuttgart, I think. Um, when I was going through customs, I was the only, the only white person in that entire line. Everyone else was Muslim. And I was talking to people. They're like, oh, yeah, I'm a refugee. I'm escaping, you know, the war that's going on right now in Israel. So they were either Jews or Muslims, basically. And even when we were just walking around in Fort Time, there was just a lot, a lot of foreigners there. So what was interesting about that is, you know, in the United States, when we go soul winning, at least for me, I'm trying to go to like the Hispanic areas. I'm trying to go to like the African-American neighborhoods because like those are like the most receptive people in the United States. But it was kind of funny because in Germany, we were like looking for white people, which is just so much different <laughs> than anywhere else because everyone else is pretty much Muslim. And let's be honest, those are not the most receptive people in the world. So it was like, we're like looking for people that look like me. I was like, this is weird. You know, this is the opposite of the United States. But it was really fun. One interesting thing about the culture there was how quiet it was. You, you never heard any honking, shouting, fighting, screaming, cussing, uh, construction. It was just like eerily quiet and peaceful. And especially on Sunday. On Sunday when everything's closed, I mean, I was flying my drone around to get some footage and I could fly that thing like a half mile away and I could still hear like the bzzz, because it's just so quiet in Germany. It was just kind of strange. Uh, one of the things about the culture there, I drove on the Autobahn and it was interesting seeing that the cars people drive there, it's all German cars. Like in America, you see Japanese cars, American cars, German cars, a whole just litany of different cars. But in Germany, they were driving German cars. It was Audi, BMW, Volkswagen, you know, things like that. You really didn't see Fords anywhere. So that was kind of cool to see uh, the German culture there. But I will say the German culture is kind of being overshadowed a little bit by the influx of the Muslims there. And that is something that's a little bit unfortunate to see. But um, when you get to the spiritual lessons that uh, I learned from this trip, number one, it's that there is still light being shown in Germany. There is still a light shining there. And, you know, the title of the sermon is Light Shining in Darkness. You know, let's just be honest about Germany. Germany is not the Bahamas. Right. Germany is not Africa. Germany is not, you know, going to be the greatest soul winning, most receptive area you could possibly go to in the world. But let me tell you something. There still is the light of the gospel shining in Germany, and there still are people getting saved. Now, like I said, the title of the sermon is Light Shining in Darkness. I kind of want to explain to you some of the darkness that's going on in Germany. And specifically, Fortheim itself is a city that has a very dark history. And it's, it's got a very tragic history. And the reason I say that is because Fortheim was virtually wiped off the face of the earth in World War II. It was almost completely destroyed. I want to read an excerpt from a book that I read. It's called Masters of the Air, America's Bomber Boys Who Fought the Air War Against Nazi Germany. If you like history, this is a really good book. I recommend it. This is a quote from that book. As long as the German government did not seek peace, there was no reason to stop the bombing. It is what was bombed and how it was bombed that is questionable, both morally and militarily. The world's focus on Dresden has obscured equal excesses. You know, most people have heard of the Dresden firebombing, right, that happened in World War II. That's a very common uh, thing that people know about. But not a lot of people know about how Fortheim was bombed. <clears throat> Fortheim is a medium-sized city in southwestern Germany that produced precision instruments and had marginal value to the Wehrmacht as a juncture for military trains. 10 days after the Dresden raid, Harris's crew, Bomber Harris, he was the air commander of the British uh, Royal Air Force, so this is talking about the British here. 10 days after the Dresden raid, Harris's crews destroyed over 80% of the town's developed area and wiped out over a quarter of its wartime population compared to roughly 5% in Dresden. So, you know, everyone knows about the Dresden fire bombings, and the Dresden fire bombings killed 5% of the wartime population. But in Fortheim, it killed over a quarter of the population living in Fortheim. That's insane. It says the, where, where did I go here? The whole place has, this is a quote from Bomber Harris. The whole place has been burned out. Harris reported to his fellow air commanders on March 1st. 
This attack, he added with evident satisfaction, is what is popularly known as a deliberate terror attack. Bomber Command has now destroyed 63 German towns in this fashion, he declared. So according to the Royal Air Force bombing commander, he said this was a terror attack. You want to talk about a holocaust. Like this was a literal, like Fort Time was a literal holocaust. It was a literal whole burnt offering where 25% of that population was killed in bombing in one night. This is another article I read about this. It said the astronomical attack that destroyed yet another medieval city center occurred on the evening of February 23rd, 1945. The first bombs were dropped at almost 8 p.m. and the last at a little past 9 p.m., so an hour straight of bombing. The attack on the clockmakers of Fort Syme included 379 aircraft, and they attacked from a height of 8,000 feet, dropping half a million high explosive and phosphorus incendiary bombs with a weight of 1,825 tons. Having been there, it's really hard to imagine this because Fort Syme is so small, you could walk the entire city. And when we were going soul winning there, we didn't use cars. You know, some of the Germans, they, they don't understand why Americans need cars. Well, and then you come to America, you realize, yeah, we need cars here. But there in Fort Time, like we were just walking everywhere. And imagine just this little small city being bombed for over an hour. The amount of devastation that happened in this place is really mind blowing. It says a firestorm immediately enveloped the heart of the town in complete devastation. The bombed gas works added fuel to the fire. The smoke over the town was so high that returning bomber crews could see the glare of the fire 160 kilometers away. In an area about three kil kilometers long and 1.5 kilometers wide, all buildings were reduced to rubble. 17,600 citizens, or one out of every three Fort Simers, were officially counted as dead and thousands were injured. Think about those numbers. This is 1945. You know, we think about 9-11 in 2001 and roughly 3,000 people died. And that's burned into the American psyche, into the American conscience, just thinking like, wow, 9-11 was crazy. How many people died in 9-11? 3,000 people, that's a lot of people. Well, here in four time, in 1945, 17 plus thousand people died in one night. That is a major tragedy right there. I'm just trigger warning. This is going to get kind of. It's going to explain how how they died here. But you know, there's some rough stuff in the Bible. There's some rough stuff in life, and and I think this will help you appreciate what God is doing now in Fort Sign. Okay. Some died instantly from the impact of the explosions. Those were the ones that were lucky. Many from burns due to the hellish burning phosphorus that seeped into the cellars of houses where they hid, and others suffocated from lack of oxygen and poisonous gases, or were crushed to death by collapsing walls. Many drowned in the river into which they had jumped, trying in vain to escape from the burning materials in the streets, but even the rivers were burning as the phosphorus material floated on the water. The phosphorus bombs formed a burning gel, which water, while extinguishing normal fires, did not quench. The gel would reignite instantly when the victim reemerged, giving them a choice between drowning or burning to death. And some people drowned themselves and or their burning children to end their suffering. That is the tragedy that happened in Pforzheim, Germany. I mean, that is just insane. But, you know, to me, and before, before I move on, let me also explain how devastating this was. On the edge of the city, there's this mountain. But it's not a real mountain. It's simply the Germans, after World War II, just took all the rubble of the city, put it on the side of the city, and just trees overgrew it and grass, and it looks like a mountain, but it's just the rubble from World War II. And everywhere you go in Germany, you could still see the scars of World War II to this day. That country was pretty much pulverized. And Fort Time specifically was basically razed to the ground, okay? Now, the reason I bring this up is not just because, you know, I like history, which I do. You can't go anywhere in Fort Time without knowing about this and thinking about this because all over the city, there's these little memorial placards saying like 1945, you know, Fort Time, 1945. And it'll show pictures of the city and then it'll be like, hey, look at this building where part of it is still standing. You know, look at this monument where part of it is still standing. And all around the city, you could see the scars from World War II. And this is something that they think about all the time, right? And that river where so many people died, like it's a big part of that city. Everywhere you go, you see monuments to the bombing of World War II. So that's why I bring that up. But look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. 
The Bible says, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know, why, why is this sermon light shining in darkness? Well, because this city has a dark past. A dark tragedy happened there. But today, basically 80 years since this happened, the light of the gospel is still shining forth in Fordsheim, Germany. Amen. And you know what? Even though in the past several thousands of people died there in a very just hellish experience, you know, now the gospel's going out and people are getting saved from the fire, from the eternal fire of hell. And, you know, yeah, it may not be as many people as get saved in the Bahamas or Africa or Mexico, but you know what? There's still real souls that are escaping the fires of hell. And you know what? That is amazing to see God's mercy and love being extended towards a people who was once destroyed. That is encouraging to me. And you know what? There's about 15 to 20 soul winners there in this soul winning club. And last year they had over 400 salvations. That is amazing. 400 salvations in Europe? I mean, that's great news. That's encouraging to see that the gospel still has power. You know, the German people are still listening to God. There's a remnant there getting saved. This year, there's been about 175 salvations. So, you know, in a two years time, 575 souls being saved from hell by a small number of people. You know what? There's light shining in darkness in Fordsheim, Germany. Amen. And that is encouraging to me. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. When I went on this trip, uh, Brother Anslam added me to their WhatsApp group, and I'm still in it, and I, I see the reports that they get of salvations, and it's very often that I saw when they went soul winning to have equal number of salvations to soul winners that they had, and that's great by even standards in the United States. I mean, if we go out and we send out 10 soul winners and get 10 people saved, like that's a great day of soul winning. That's fantastic. And I was seeing that happen multiple times in Germany. Like, that is pretty cool. Now, obviously, that doesn't happen every time. There's times where you go out and you don't get anyone saved. But what I'm saying is that people are still getting saved in Germany. That excites me. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3. It says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So, you know, what is the light of this world? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you have a country that's historically dark spiritually, and that is dark spiritually right now, you know, the cure for that is the light of the gospel. And it doesn't matter how dark it gets in this world, the light of the gospel will always have power. Why? Verse 5, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. In ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And to me, it is encouraging to see a group of people in Germany that face persecution, that don't live in the most receptive place in the world, where it's not the easiest place to be a Christian, yet they recognize, hey, the light of the gospel has been shown in my heart. And so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go out and shine that light where I am in Germany. And that was exciting and encouraging to see. These people don't have a pastor. These people don't have a new IFB church. They don't have someone holding their hand and, you know, teaching them every single thing. And these people are going out, traveling huge distances. Many of these people are driving four hours away from different parts of Europe and Germany just to go soul winning. Yet there's Christians today that can't be bothered to show up to a soul winning time once a week when someone will drive you, someone will give you the material, someone will give you a soul winning seminar. You got the freedom to do it here. And there's Germans that are sacrificing so much and preaching in a dark place just out of the love of souls, out of love of the gospel. And you know what? That is encouraging to see. Go to Psalm 126. <clears throat> Psalm 126, and you know, it, it also is just amazing to me to see a place that was once virtually completely destroyed, yet we're seeing hundreds and hundreds of people being saved. That is 
the long suffering of God right there. Psalm 126, verse 1. The Bible says, When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. You know, talking about the children of Israel that were under the ba Babylonian captivity, and of course, God turned again that captivity, and that's something to rejoice over, right? Well, in the same way, you could look at the Germans as, as being people that have experienced some really dark, terrible things, and now there's some good things happening in Germany, the gospel being shown. Verse 2, then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. And you know, that's what the Germans are doing. The German soul winners there are going unto the heathen and they're saying, hey, the Lord has done great things for God's people. What is the great thing that God has done? Well, but God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the great thing that God has done for all of us. And that's the message that these Germans are bringing to the lost in Fort Sime. Verse three, the Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. And I would imagine that's the prayer of the German soul winners there, is that Germany would become more free, more godly, more open to the gospel. But look at verse five, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You know, a lot of people would be down on a missions trip to Germany or dedicating so much time, resources, money into Germany. But you know what? It doesn't matter where the word of God is being preached. If you go forth weeping, bearing precious seed, you will doubtless come again with rejoicing. Amen. And you see that even in Germany. Yeah, it's not the most receptive place in the world, but still they're going forth with the word of God, with a tear in the eye, with love in their heart for their fellow man and for Jesus Christ. And they are doing a great work for God there. <clears throat> Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> Number two, there are still steadfast Christians in Germany. Number one, hey, the light of the gospel is still going out there. Number two, there are still steadfast Christians in Germany. 2 Timothy 3.10, the Bible says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You know, the Bible promises us that if you have a desire to go out and live godly for Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. And it doesn't matter where you live in this world. Here in America, we've experienced some persecution. You know, we've gone through protests. We've had our money stolen. We've had lawsuits. We've had stuff like that. But I'm going to be honest, the persecution that the Germans have gone through, in my eyes, is way more than we've gone through. And these guys are like my heroes in the faith seeing the things that they have been through and the steadfast attitude that they have. Now, I understand Brother Anselm this evening is going to get into depth as far as to some of the things that they've gone through as far as persecution. So I'm not going to get too much in depth into that this morning. But I do just want to touch on the surface a couple of things. So first, these Christians there, they're not just preaching the gospel, which in and of itself is great and something to be celebrated. But the Germans there, they are taking a bold stance on every word of God. And let me tell you something. In America, we're so blessed where we can get up and preach whatever we want. And very rarely do we face any consequences for that. But the men in Germany that have done this, that have stood up behind a pulpit and preached the word of God, they have faced real consequences for doing that. And to see their attitude and their steadfastness and their love for God and just continuing through that is inspirational to me. You know, one thing that they constantly go through is that they're constantly in the news media over there. Let me read a couple of uh, headlines for you. German Baptist Church wants death penalty for gay people. Good job, Germans. That's great. That's wonderful. That's good preaching right there. Leviticus 2013. Here's another headline. Fort Time Baptist Church prays for the death of a theologian. Now, it's not just a theologian that's saved. It's a false prophet that teaches you could lose your salvation, that's damning people to hell. And one of the preachers there got up and prayed for the death of that false prophet. And you know what? They got hated by the community for it. 
They got on the news for it. Four-time congregation prays for the death of a pastor. Again, just keep praying for it. Here's another one. Gay hatred and death wishes, the balance sheet of the radical sect in Fortime. So, you know, in, in the eyes of the world, God's people preaching the Bible is radical. And they think that, they're, that, that Christians are so radical. When I showed up to Germany, I somehow made the news in Fortime. I didn't even do anything. <laughs> All of a sudden, I just see this German article. It's like, it could be confirmed that Dylan Oz is in Fortime. The guy that said that faggots should be lined up against the wall and shot in the back of the head. And it's just like, you just show up as a Christian and all these atheistic, fag-loving freaks in Germany are like, ah, the Christians are here! But to me, that's a testament that these are some steadfast Christians. Not only are they soul winning, they're preaching the whole word of God. Thank God for that. They also receive opposition from false prophets. Go to Acts chapter 13, Acts chapter number 13. Acts 13, verse 5, the Bible says, And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John to their minister. And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus. That's a good trifecta, right? Sorcerer, false prophet, Jew. By the way, in, in Germany, it's a little... Un, uh, it's not politically correct to talk about Jews. I don't know if you realize that in Germany. And, and so the Germans there called them Brazilians. So when I was preaching, I was, I was preaching about the Brazilians. And just every time the Bible said the word Jew, I said the word Jew. But when I was just talking, I said Brazilians, trying to become all things to all men, you know, fit into the culture there. Verse 7, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. So there's a deputy there. He wants to hear the word of God. He wants to get saved. But Eliamus the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. So what did this false prophet wanted to do? He wanted to turn people away from the truth. And this is what false prophets always do. And they've got a big name false prophet that the, the German Christians there deal with. This man named Lothar Gossman. And he is a guy that teaches that you can lose your salvation and he's constantly preaching against the soul winners there. And he's constantly trying to turn people away from the truth of the gospel. But verse 9 says, Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, so he's not in the, in the flesh here, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? So notice when someone's trying to turn people away from salvation, Paul, being filled with the Holy Spirit of God, called this man a child of the devil. And you know what? We should have no love or respect or friendship with false prophets. And yes, if someone is a false prophet turning people away from heaven, there's nothing in the world wrong with praying for that person's death yeah. right. like the Germans have done. Yeah. And of course, that causes a lot of problems for them. You know, the community thinks they're crazy. But look at the result, verse 11. And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. You know, even though Paul had to deal with this false prophet, even though he called him out, even though this false prophet was trying to stop the gospel from going out, trying to stop people from getting stay, saved, there still was this deputy that believed. Yeah. And you know what I saw in Germany? I saw a group of people being steadfast Christians, preaching the whole word of God, being persecuted by the community, and people still getting saved. Yeah. And there's actually a funny story where I was soul winning with Brother Moses, and Brother Moses was preaching the gospel to someone in German, and I noticed these two big dudes near us one looked like kind of an arabic guy another one was a black dude and i'm looking at these guys and like they are just staring at me and the way soul winning worked in fort Sime, like i said we're not going door to door we're just walking around the city we usually walked down this like common strip mall area all the way down one side all the way back and you pretty much just do that all day long talking to people so we're we start on one side i see them they're they're looking at us they're watching us i'm like okay i'm gonna keep an eye on these guys we keep walking and going on doing our thing soul winning and i notice there they are again they're still staring at me. And we move a little further down the road. There they are again. They're still staring at me. And I was like, 
we're about to get jumped. I was like, we're, we're about to get jumped in Germany here. You know, we're going to experience some sort of fight. I'm like, oh, man. I was like, hey, Moses, these guys are following us. Like, I don't know what their intention, intentions are, and I'm just, like, preparing for this. I, didn't, I was like, man, what's going on? Well, he gets done preaching to someone, and all of a sudden these guys, they start walking over, and they start talking to him, and I'm like, oh, man, it's about to go down. And I don't understand anything they're saying. They're speaking German super fast, and my German was not at that level of proficiency. But turn to find out, they weren't wanting to fight us. They didn't hate us. They saw him in the news, and they saw the persecution of the church. They're just like, we just want to encourage you. We agree with your stance. We like you guys. You guys are doing awesome. And I was like, that is amazing. That is so cool. You know, you got Lothar Gossman trying to turn people away from the faith, trying to teach you could lose your salvation, you know, calling the cops against the Christians there, trying to get them arrested, trying to get them to deal with all this stuff. Yet you got the community there who hears about it, and they're on God's people's side. And that is, that's a cool thing to see. Many of them receiving persecution from the government. I'm going to let Brother Anselm talk a lot about that. I just want to say one story that I heard of a lady who was a first-time visitor to the Soul Winning Club, and she showed up to hear the preaching, and she came home and was greeted by the police at her home, wow. interrogating her simply for showing up to a preaching service. Wow. Wow. And people in America like to complain. <laughs> oh, you know, the police are so bad here. You know, Dude, you don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Like, there, there's Christians in Germany that get questioned by the police simply for listening to a church service. And that was incredible to me to see her. Look, here she is with the group. I mean, how, how many Americans, if they came to our church for the first time and then they were followed by the police and questioned by the police, would ever come back? Yeah. Probably wouldn't happen very often. Yet this lady, she was questioned and then she came back and she was there when I was there. That was great to see. They face oppositions from their jobs. Many of them have lost their jobs. They face oppositions from the laws of Germany itself, being that it's illegal to homeschool in Germany. It's illegal to spank your children in Germany. It's illegal to preach hate speech, <laughs> Volksverhetzung, which doesn't that mean heating people up? Yeah, you can't, you can't heat people up in Germany, okay? I just, I just love how these atheistic, you know, liberal Germans, they just want to get away from their history of being Nazis so bad that they end up being like the Nazis. Like, you can't say this. We're going to dictate what you can and cannot say. Oh, you can't raise your children. Give your children to the government. It's like, wait, I, I thought you were, like, ashamed of, like, your Nazi past. Yeah. Now you want to be a Nazi saying, like, yeah. you can and can't do this. It's like, what is wrong with these people? Yeah. Volksverhetzung, can't heat people up, no hate speech, can't preach against the Jews, that's for sure. The Brazilians, go to Matthew chapter number 5. <laughs> Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. That's that group there. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. And you know, one of the reasons why I was so encouraged when I went to Germany and I met these people is I saw a group of people that was experiencing more persecution than any of us in America have faced. And I saw them have a good attitude. I saw them rejoicing. I saw them happy to be a soul winner, happy to be around God's people, happy to preach the word of God. And you know what, that is a great example for us, that we too should rejoice when we're persecuted for righteousness sake. Number three, last spiritual lesson that I learned, we're almost done this morning, is that there is still a lot of work to be done in Germany. You know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Germany is a tougher place to exist as a Christian than in the United States, than in the Bahamas, than in other places. There's 84 million people in that country. And there's, as far as I know, one soul winning group in that country that I know of. So there is, I mean, correct, am I right on that? Is one that you know of? Or is there more? One that I know of, one that I know of okay? Now, there's gonna, it's going to take a lot more than one soul winning group to reach Germany with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look at Matthew chapter five, verse 13. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lo have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. You know, though it is a harder place to preach than here, you know, those soul winners there, 
are still the salt preserving that nation. Because what if Germany didn't have that soul winning group? Well, then those 575 people in four time would be going to hell when they die. And so, yeah, you know, you could just choose to look at Germany and have a pessimistic attitude. Well, it's a liberal nation. Well, it's got all these issues. Yeah, but you know what? There's still salt in Germany. There's still soul winners there, and there's still a lot of work to be done. And what we should do is we should be praying for those soul winners there. We should be encouraging them. And if you can join them, if you could go on a trip to encourage them, you know, that's really what they need more than anything is just encouragement. Because a lot of them, they feel kind of alone because they don't have a church there. They don't, they don't have a Pastor Anderson there. They don't have a, a missions conference there. They don't have all these independent fundamental Baptist churches on every street corner like we do here in America. And so, you know, they really need some encouragement from God's people. Go to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 9. And if you also get your place in 1 Corinthians 15, those will be the last two verses we go to this morning. Matthew 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Matthew 9, verse 36, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. That really is the spiritual case in Germany right now. There's a lot of sheep without a shepherd. Thus then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye, therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. So, you know, God, God is ready to reap a harvest. You know, the fields are white unto harvest. It's, it's, the work is available to be done in Germany, but the problem is that the laborers are few. The same problem that they have is the same problem that everywhere in the world has, that every community has, is that we're lacking soul winners. And what they need, they need some more soul winners in Germany. They need some more soul winners to go there or to be trained there, but they need more laborers. So, you know, my assessment for Germany is, no, it's not the most receptive place on earth, but yes, people are still being saved. And for that reason, it is worth it to invest in that country. It is worth it to invest in those souls. Yes, God's people are being persecuted there, but they're still doing great works for God. Amen. Yes, they're receiving opposition from the community, from false prophets, from the news, but you know what? They're, they're doing a great work there. They're shaking things up there. Germany need more, needs more soul winners, needs more soul winning clubs, and Lord willing, in the future, it needs more churches. You know, because I think when, when you go out, you try to do a great work for God, especially in a dark place like Germany, where the devil has pretty much conquered, right? And you're trying to fight against that. You're going to experience a lot of persecution. But, you know, I think there is hope for Europe. And I would love to see in the next 10, 20 years, Churches being started all over Europe and trying to turn the tide there a little bit. Most importantly, I think that Germany needs a German-born pastor, a German citizen pastor, because I just don't see it in the cards of, you know, it's already hard to find pastors in this world. I don't really see it in the cards of taking an American pastor and sending him to Germany where it's illegal to homeschool children, where it's illegal to spank your children, where you're going to be facing all these issues. To me, it makes sense, of course, common sense missions. You know, let's go to the receptive first. But, you know, if there's a German out there that has a heart for reaching his country, you know, I want to encourage that man to take the work of God seriously, to get qualified, to work hard, because Germany does need a German-born pastor, for sure, to lead the work there. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, this will be the last place that we go. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. The Bible says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And, you know, I just want to encourage the soul winners that are there in Germany to know your labor is not in vain. You know, you might be going through hard times, but you need to remain steadfast because the work that you are doing is of eternal value. It is making a difference. You are saving lots of people. And so don't give up. Even though it's hard, even though you're in persecution, don't give up. Continue to be steadfast. Continue to fight. And for us, I just hope that you would join me in praying for the brethren in Germany. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this great conference and for Pastor Anderson's vision here to reach the world. I do pray that the gospel would go forth powerfully in Germany and in Fortsheim. I pray that you would bless and protect 
the soul winners that are there, that they would be encouraged to be a light in their community in any way that they can. We love you. Pray for safety and blessing for the remainder of this conference. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.